Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is t a p i s a m b e k I am head of policy and analysis division at the APO. Thank you for joining our, our session today. Uh, we'd like to talk about the Wicked7 project. Christian Zakhar is the co-founder of the Wicked7 project, a design initiated to save humanity from itself, along with Philip Kotler, the father of modern marketing. Christian is setting out to redesign society and our place in nature. He needs your help, and that's why he's here. He was a speaker at TEDx and at the Global Peter Drucker Forum in 2019. He is the co-author with Philip Kotler of the book, The Brand Activism, From Purpose to Action. Hello, Christian. How are you today? Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, David. I'm so glad that I can explain this project to your viewers. and I hope that they will get something useful out of it. Uh, I'd like to start by talking about what is the Wicked7 project. Uh, it so happens that this sort of was a spin-off from a book that Philip Kotler and I wrote called Brand Activism from Purpose to Action. The idea was that companies that are um, sort of interested in fixing uh, some of the world's most urgent problems can't do it by themselves, of course. They've got to get together with other companies, governments, NGOs, all working together in a collaborative way to solve these most urgent problems. And if we don't solve them now, as COVID-19 has, has shown us, uh, pretty much, you know, we, we, we're going to have a very unstable world. And so the, the gist of this idea is, let's start working on these wicked problems right away. And we, we've said, okay, which problems do we work on first? And you can pick one problem, but you really can't because they're all interconnected. So what we did is we decided that let's pick the most urgent problems, uh, which is what came out of the book, and create sort of this project, which brings together people from all over the world to save humanity from itself. And that's just a tongue-in-cheek way of saying solving some of the world's most urgent problems. So we have climate collapse, inequality, extremism, war, corruption, health and livelihood, population, migration. These are not problems that are going to be solved overnight. They're not going to be solved by one institution or one government or one business. They need uh, worldwide collaboration and, and cooperation. So what we thought is that we would start digging into these problems find out what the experts are saying and connect the dots between them. Because one of the issues that we came up, we basically have decided that, that is a problem is that experts, while they're really good at what they do, don't generally connect with the expert with the, uh, in the linking problem that's right next door to them. And so we want to, they play in their own sandboxes and don't really talk to each other much. So this is a way for us to start modeling these problems and the experts who can solve them so that we create sort of a digital twin of the a virtual version simulation of this problem uh, that we can actually experiment with, test, put assumptions out there, and, and actually visualize these problems. So that's what this project's about. It's really a platform for the common good, and we want everybody to be involved. Everybody who has some... piece of expertise to contribute, some vision, some ideas, some expertise. And of course, you know, these problems are so complex that they can't be solved by, at, you know, at the local level. And it's, there's no one size fits all. There's all multiple versions of solutions. And so what we feel like is that this is a platform uh, for purpose that we can basically create, bring people in, test ideas, And, and take it and then try to uh, learn the lessons from what we learn as, as we do this. Um, so it goes back to what is a wicked problem? Uh, wicked problems were described first in, I think, early 70s by, uh, in a, a magazine, in, a, in an article called Dilemmas in General Theory of Planning, which said that there are some problems that just can't be solved very easily at all. 
because uh, uh, solutions, you try to fix one thing, it just creates unintended co uh, consequences and you end up creating even worse problems as you so try to solve these wicked problems. So that the definition of a wicked problem has been with us for a long time. And what we're saying is every wicked problem must have a virtuous solution. Here's an example of a country that was having some issues and how a consultant basically came and said, this is how you solve the problem. And so what the, what the government, what the, uh, the institutional leaders basically said, if we understood this pro uh, chart, uh, then we would understand how to solve the problem. And this was sort of the first example, which was made fun of, by the way, of how uh, 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 a wicked problem must be looked at from, with all its sort of conditions and all its uh, influences. So it's, it's not a five force diagram, it's a 55 or 105 force diagram uh, where you have all these forces interacting with each other. And it, unless you understand the relationships between all these uh, different types of uh, actors and, and resources, uh, you're not gonna understand what's going on. So what we're saying is, Wicked problems do have virtuous solutions, and a virtuous solution is, a, is really a wicked problem, the opposite of a wicked problem. It's sort of what would happen if we did everything right. And again, since it's a simulation, we can start theorizing. So this is not something you have to do in the real world. It's something that you model. And by modeling it in a virtual sense, you can start checking your assumptions that if we do this, can this, uh, will this work? Will this outcome be achieved if we change this, these parameters? And these are things that can be tested in reality and then brought back. So we are creating sort of a, uh, an intelligent model, although right now it's a pretty basic. The idea is that you have this Wikipedia in the sky of wicked problems, which everybody contributes to, and then we start solving them uh, with the experts, with the governments, with the NGOs that want to participate. That's sort of the, the thesis behind uh, this project. Um, one of the biggest things here is there's no end to this thing. It's a continuous thing. You know, that it's not a, you know, that you can't just say, okay, I've solved the problem because uh, as you know, a wicked problem doesn't have a solution, doesn't end. It's always ongoing. So it's basically how do you manage uh, this process? And that's what uh, the first process that we want to manage is this, how do we create a process of discovery that helps people solve wicked problems? What's interesting for an organization, perhaps like APO, is you don't have to use this process to solve uh, you know, the world's most urgent problems. You can actually use them to solve the problems that you're having with your organization. There's an article, I believe, a while back called a strategy as a wicked problem. I don't know if you guys remember that, but it was basically saying the same thing, that companies must look at strategy as a wicked problem. And if we really look at the shape of the world today and the state of the world today, it's pretty obvious that we need to get to work on this ASAP right away. Um, with COVID-19, especially in the US and pretty much all over the world, we are now looking at a global sort of collapse of the economic uh, health across the world. And the question is, when we rebuild this economy, there is no new normal that we can say unless we build an economy that actually works for everyone. And that's part of this process is how do, we're going to ask these questions as part of this project. How do we build an economy that serves everybody, not just a few, not just uh, the profit economy, not just the public economy, but what can we build that uh, sort of creates a, a, a common good so the economy works not just for everyone, but also for nature, because nature has been too often excluded from sort of our model of, of the economy. And that's one reason why we are where we are uh, again. So this is sort of the process we're using. We start with a declaration of interdependence, the opposite of uh, independence, so what this says is, guys, we're all in this together. Everybody in the world, doesn't matter uh, you know, how small your country is, how big your company is, we're all in this boat, you know, the big blue planet. Uh, and we've got, to, we've got to sort of help each other and, that, and find these solutions. So that's what this is. Start with the Declaration of Interdependence. 
Then we decided, okay, how can we get a whole bunch of smart people together to start giving us advice on how we might want to solve and approach solving this problem? So we assembled a wide variety of uh, fairly smart people from various institutions, uh, business, academia, um, art artists who see different, the world a little differently than you and me. And we want them, their opinions to be part of this advisory group uh, so that we can frame the right questions to get at the right problems. And that's sort of what we've been doing. And uh, number four and five, once you have a process to enable the active discovery of what it is that makes up a wicked problem, then we've got to create a platform where we can actually solve these problems. So this process is what we've started. Uh, and, and, uh, and I'll go through them, uh, the pieces really, really quickly here. The first part, as I mentioned, was a theory and a declaration of interdependence. As it happens, Henry Mintzberg, Professor Henry Mintzberg, has already done this, and he's done an excellent job, which we feel like uh, should be publicized all over the world. This is almost like a, a manifesto for a world that works together, and this is what we need now more than ever before. So, uh, you know, you, you can check it out independently of our project, but he's also part of our project, and we're using this as the first step. Uh, that when you start thinking about solutions, you've got to be inclusive. These are the members that we have signed up so far. And you'll see some of these people are really, really incredible people in their field. Some are tech people, some are, uh, uh, how should I call it? Uh, they're all thought leaders in their various fields. Uh, and, and, and what's really interesting is that when I asked them and when we asked them and invited them to be part of this, they didn't hesitate. They jumped on uh, pretty much instantly. And that's what's part of this, uh, what's the magic of, of this kind of a problem, uh, of this kind of project. When you frame a pro a problems that are so big, it's almost ridiculous and naive, and yet uh, we have to solve them. And so this is sort of the urgency of, of, of what we uh, face today. Uh, another part of this is sort of the, the idea and importance of the cultural narratives that we come to, that we bring to the picture. When we look at a problem, we often reflect and understand the problem uh, from where we sit. So if we sit in a high station in society, we view it from that station. If we're in the bottom of the pyramid or the base of the pyramid, we view it a little differently. Isn't, it, isn't that the case? So how we view our problems are often defined by sort of the lens of meaning that we assign, that we have based on who we are. And this is why we oftentimes can't work together because we have cultural clashes, ideology clashes, identity clashes, our histories don't, we don't agree on what history is. And what we're saying is it's time to find common ground and put away that stuff. And this, is, this project in a sense is a way to do that without polarization without making this a uh, left versus right problem. I mean, if you can't breathe, you can't breathe. It doesn't matter if you're, uh, you, know, what, you know, who you are. It, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a life threatening condition. And um, so that, that's sort of what we're trying to say is that we wanna go beyond the cultural narratives that we come from to create an, a new narrative for a world that needs, needs a new narrative. And so what do we mean by narrative again? Basically, a narrative, if you think about it, it's, it's sort of a leader might have a vision for where, you know, society needs to go. That vision, if it's done by one person, is dangerous. But if it's done collectively, we want to create a vision for where we, the world needs to go together. And, and I think that's part of this process is that we start creating these visions. And not everybody has to agree with everything. That's not what we're saying. But we have to have a trajectory of hope versus a trajectory of fear. And that's part of this creating a new cultural narrative for the planet and for really for everyone. Um, how to understand these cultural narratives. And, and, you know, people think, yeah, it's not a big deal. But one of the reasons why uh, the U.S. hasn't been able to handle this COVID thing is because we've polarized each other with two cultural narratives. One that says, if you wear a mask, it's a good thing. One of them that says, if you wear a mask, or you're taking away my freedom. What's ridiculous about this is that 
we just have to follow reality, the facts, science, you know, <laughs> and, and the fact that we can't do that tells you how powerful cultural narratives are and how powerful is, is sort of the, the, the problem of change. And so we've been studying sort of how do you build cultural consensus? How do you create meaning that brings everybody on board? And how do you build trust between institutions, governments, uh, individuals, and of course, businesses, so that we actually build a, a future that's worth uh, you know, living for, for our children. So part of this is we also um, working on, and we've built some tools. Part of this is that we've built some tools, open source tools to help us learn how to solve these problems, to help us discover sort of the ramifications of what happens, what causes what, and how do we look at these problems? So let me, let me explain this a little further. Uh, this is our Wicked Problem Discovery Canvas. And what it does, it basically says, let's look at the problem. And by the way, this can be used for any kind of uh, complex problem. It doesn't have to be a wicked problem that we're talking about. It could be a problem in your organization, which would be you, you, in the middle box here in the, in the center, you put in the observable facts. Here are the facts of what I see or what we're noticing, or what we're experiencing right now. Then you go backwards and ask why to find what caused this. And of course, there's many reasons for, for why this happened. And so you put them all down and you find out which are the causes and you can go backwards in time. You have historical causes, you have cultural reasons, and then you have just you know natural disasters, pandemics, policy, and so the, the point being, if you go backwards this way, you, you, you do the why. If you go the other way, which is in the future, you ask what's next and you can simulate using this model what, what happens next and, and in order to avoid the negative uh, consequences. And let me show you what I mean by that in, in a slide here that comes up real soon. So this slide here is sort of a wicked map, a wicked model of the COVID-19 COVID uh pandemic issue that we have facing the world today. This is what happens when you do everything wrong. And, you know, there's some countries that have done this uh, worse than others. And that's what this demonstrates. So if you do everything wrong, if you don't quarantine people properly, if you don't have the testing, if you don't have the planning, if you have weak leadership, if you don't have public health care infrastructure, a lot of bad things happen. And one thing feeds another. And this is how you have a problem that, that goes out of control. On the other hand, if you actually have the virtuous map, which is what happens when you do everything right. And of course, nobody does everything right. This is sort of, these are theoretical models. Here's sort of the worst, of worst case, and here's sort of the best case. Quick detection, uh, slowing the spread, flattening the curve, social distancing, contact tracing, all the best practices. So you have a country like Vietnam or New Zealand or ROC, and what do they do right that we can learn from? And so this is sort of a way to model the, what actually happened for a problem. And this is, of course, a very wicked problem, as, you can, as, as we all know now. COVID-19 has a lot of far-reaching, unintended consequences across the board, from the economy to education to everything, uh, world trade, everything. And so we feel like this, these examples are just sort of case studies, if you will, to start help us thinking, think this way. And that's what, what we want to do in, in, in turn for each of those seven problems, connect the dots between the wicked uh, version and the virtuous uh, solutions for, for each one of these problems. How are we going to do that? Uh, we've done this once before for a project called the $300 House Project. And the idea is that you have a digital platform where you invite people, experts, governments, businesses to join in and participate in an open source sort of environment to create these maps. And in our case, it's gonna be these maps that we, we're gonna offer as, as open source uh, CC uh, content for everyone to uh, you know, use and learn from. And so we have a, a platform here, uh, the company is from Berlin um, and they're very uh, innovative. They, have a, they already have a platform of about 100,000, above 100,000 designers who are part of it. And what we say is we want to bring another 100,000 people to be part of this platform so that we actually have uh, people from every part of the world 
uh, engaged and thinking about these problems. We're not going to solve this problem, by the way, these problems individually, or there's, there's really no, it's an ecosystem thing and not an ego system thing. Okay. Uh, so that's where we are today. We're just getting ready to start the open search on this digital platform. So we're almost there. And what we want to do is think about ways in which these urgent problems can be modeled. Uh, we want to create sort of the briefs for this and start uh, solving them. And uh, if you want to learn more about this stuff, uh, it's at wicked7.org. Uh, feel free to join us and uh, learn more. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, I think it's really insightful. So how is it going to be relevant to our organization, like a productivity organization? We talk about 21 member countries. We are want to really want to boost productivity. We talk about innovation-led productivity. We talk about productivity 6.0. And then how is it going to be relevant to our productivity based upon your uh, presentation? Okay, that's a good question. So let's think of it this way. When you, when you try to uh, analyze any kind of problem, you know, in the whole world, of, uh, sort of, uh, let's say, Deming's world and, and the quality control world and the Six Sigma world, you have all these processes and, and charts that you can use, you know, the Ishikawa diagram, the uh, root cause diagrams to try to find the source of problems so you can fix them. In a way, a wicked problem is actually a problem that can't be solved on one dimension or one thing. It's, it's got multiple issues that are hitting it. And I think I mentioned this, uh, or maybe I didn't, but strategy in itself is a wicked problem. How you operate is a wicked problem because there's so many moving parts. And in the global world that's hit by COVID, that's a wicked problem. So if nothing else, this uh, sort of thinking of how do you look at wicked problems and how do you examine sort of the cultural, historical, how did you get to this place? And then what can you do to avoid the missteps and the bad things that could go wrong so that you can plan ahead, uh, even on the fly, actually, to, to try to figure out what, what, what's the right thing to do. So I feel like if you look at this process of how do you solve a wicked problem, Wicked problems aren't just problems that are urgent problems for humanity. Every company has wicked problems. You might have a wicked problem in your own department because there are multiple things that are interacting together and you can't figure out how to stop it. One way to do it is diagram it, map it out, map out sort of the worst case, map out the best case. And I'm going to give you a little secret. Uh, this idea of the wicked cycle and the virtuous cycle came to us from a guy named Leonard Schlesinger who wrote an article many years ago, which was called Breaking the Cycle of Failure in Services, which is an operations-based thing that says you have a cycle of success. If you treat your employees right, train them properly, look after them, train them, give them the right policies, then they'll be able to serve the customer properly. They'll be able to do everything right. And, and if you retain those good employees, you'll have higher profits. So this is sort of the cycle of success. The cycle of failure is you don't treat your employees right. You don't train them properly. You don't pay them properly. You don't look after them properly. They, you know, they don't really care about their jobs too much. The standards aren't very good. Guess what? Your, your customer is upset. Your product profits go down. You lose customers. So this cycle of success and cycle of failure from this article, Breaking the Cycle of Failure in Services, by Leonard Schlesinger, who, by the way, is part of our team, like I said, is where we got this idea in the first place. So solving this wicked problem thing is actually not so different from solving a problem in your own company or your own government or your own organization. As you know, that there are many other organizations like international organizations or INGOs, even UN. They all address these problems and they try to resolve those problems. So what differentiates you or project from those yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, the way we look at it is, you know, each of these organizations from the World Economic Forum to the UN to the Drucker Forum, everybody sort of has great intentions and they're all working actually as best they can to solve these problems. But part of the issue that we find is that they stop at a certain boundary. 
And the solution usually to this problem is outside that boundary on the other side. And they never go to that side because their charter or perhaps it's their uh, the limits of what the organization was actually con uh, built to do uh, does not allow them perhaps to cross those boundaries. So we're going to be naive and ignorant and say, we don't know. And that's why we're just going to start mapping this out and asking people to come in and join us, add their two cents of information. And it's really sort of a Wikipedia type concept that everybody brings a little bit of expertise. And then of course we find the experts and what they are saying and bring that in there, but we cross boundaries. And that I think is the most important differentiator is that we are uh, not, uh, how should I call it, bound by any budgets or answerable to anybody. In other words, we're not uh, going to be told what to do, but we're just going to follow the facts and say, let's let's map this out. And that's sort of the, the process. We're not even going to name names. When we do this, it's not about right versus left or right and wrong, any of that. It's just, okay, how do we solve the problem? Where has it been solved better in the world? Because a lot of these problems have been solved in small places. And we say, okay, what can we learn from that experience to, to map out a, a better solution? And anybody is welcome to take these maps and do with it what they like. So it's not something that we're going to be keeping to ourselves or anything. It's just going to be free to everybody. Uh, you know, any organization, any individual, any company can join us or take what they want from this thing. And that's sort of how we're different. So depending on the how well developed their economy is, the way they can approach these issues can be different. But some countries may say, oh, no, actually, we are not there yet. So we still have a long way to go. We have to develop our economy. We really have to develop our country. And in the process, we might have to deal with this problem. But maybe we can deal with this problem later after we are done developing our country. And those countries who are already advanced countries will say that, no, no, now is the time. If you do it later, it's going to be too late. Yeah, you can say that because you're already advanced. So how we are going to uh, issue, uh, deal with this issue, the wealth, wealth gap and then- well, The wealth gap, as you know, is also relative because you know when people say that poverty, the poverty rate is $2 or $3, let's say um, a, a day, and under that is poverty and above that you're great, who can live on $3 a day? So this, this idea of $3 a day is a joke. I mean, <laughs> you can't, and, I mean, it's, it's, it's more than half the world two thirds, three fourths of the world is in poverty. And by poverty, we mean abject poverty. So we have a society that's very unequal. The world is very unequal. So the question then becomes, how does, what is it uh, about this fairy tale of econ economic growth that we want uh, people to learn from? And so what's more important than economic growth is economic justice. We cannot have this kind of income inequality that bring, takes us back to the Middle Ages. Even in the rich countries that are so-called advanced countries, we have income inequality that goes back, uh, is higher than the Great Depression, for example, in, in the US. So that's not a sustainable economy for the people, for the vast majority of people. A few people do well, and a f very few do very well, but everybody else does very badly. That's sort of the Middle Ages. We don't want to go back to that, and we're going back to that, even though we're so advanced. So one could say that our measures and our metrics are wrong. And one example of that is uh, New Zealand has changed its metrics in terms of how they measure progress or sort of the, the, the goodness of their governmental budget. So what they have done, instead of measuring GDP, they've actually got initiatives to measure sort of the welfare and, and strength of, of the people. And if you're not serving the people, well, who are you there to serve? So that's sort of a very enlightened and a, maybe a new wave of thinking that is going to spread across uh, the world. And we feel that by modeling some of these things, we may find some new things that we have not thought about before. What's the job of government? Sure, it's got to protect its people. It's got to keep people safe. But even more importantly, it's got to create opportunities for people to be the best that they can be. And if your government isn't doing that and can't do that, then I guess the question is, what will it take to create that kind of a structure and that kind of vision for your government to 
become that kind of a government. And we see a tiny country like New Zealand headed in that direction. You talk about the climate collapse. And what I have seen is that it's not only about whether UN or other organizations or governments are doing a great job or not. I think there are tons of ways to actually address that issue. At the same time, I see people's behavior that, for example, let's say that you go somewhere, you get a gift, and then if they think that the gift is not well wrapped, then they feel offended. And then you go to a supermarket and you go somewhere to buy something. And then depending on the country's culture, but some countries, they think that if you don't wrap it very well, then they will think that they don't res that you don't respect them. So what I see is that we, why do we have to wrap all these things? Why do we have to put everything in the plastic bags? Because we are going to dump it within five to 10, sec 10 minutes after we bought it. And then we just went arrive home. We're just going to dump it. It's only because the, they want to show that courtesy or you know, they want to treat the customers very well. That's why I just wrapped it up very well. But what I'm trying to say is that when I see those things, it really comes down to the people's mindset. And it's very difficult to change their, the way they think. And when it comes to the, the customer relationship, they think that wrapping is very important. So and, I'm talking about changing of the mindset and men mentality. Right. No, that's that's yeah, true. Yeah. It, it's it's a real problem because the stories we tell ourselves of what's acceptable when you gift get a gift, and what's not acceptable, are obviously wrong. Same thing with sort of our entire culture and pretty much across the world is built on consumption, and convincing people using marketing to buy something they don't need. And that's what drives the economy. So we need to create a new kind of economy with a new narrative and a new story that says, if you're wasteful, that's embarrassing. That's actually an embarrassment to you. So it's it's going to be a kind of a public shaming thing that's going to have to happen. Is in the U.S. wearing fur. You know, it used to be that all people who wanted to show off would go around wearing, you know, mink and all these fancy fur things as part of their status. Well, then people came along and said, that's actually evil. You're, you know, it's not nice. It's it's a dead animal you're wearing. And and it became, they changed again, almost overnight. The, the idea of wearing fur became a not cool thing to do. So if you can change the perception of what is acceptable and unacceptable, almost to peer pressure, that is one example of how you change culture. So we have to create new stories for what is acceptable and not acceptable. And you know, the kids are doing this. They're already mm. saying Black Lives Matter. They're saying, you know, the environment matters. They're saying we want a just economy. We want a wage that is a living wage. And we're not going to accept all these other stories that you've been t telling yourself in the past. So part of it is the youth are going to change the story. But part of it is we can think a little bit for ourselves and say, you know, we need to slow down consumption. We don't need to have fast fashion where you buy a new shirt every day. We don't need that. You can buy Patagonia has turned that into a new uh, mantra for, you know, when you when you stop wearing your Patagonia shirt, you can return it to them and they'll repair it and sell it again in their used mm. store. So there is a cultural shift happening. And I think we can join and create these new stories together. And that's part of our project too. We have actually identified and we're uh, discussing these cultural problems. I'll give you another example. In a company mm. that's trying to change, you know, the change from the top is a little slower than the employees. So you have employees which will say, hey, this is unacceptable for a company to do this. We want to move in this direction, which we consider uh, the right way, which is to be more full of justice and in the direction of justice. And society has already moved that direction. Employees move in that direction. So guess who has to follow? And an example of that is the NFL with the, with the Black Lives Matter and this kneeling thing. You know, Colin Kaepernick is the first guy who did it. And then slowly, slowly, and now finally... The commissioner of, 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 of uh, the NFL says he agrees with him after after they banned him from the sport. So, you know, cultural change and social change is very hard, but it can be done. And in fact, it has to be done if we want to want to live.
Mm. I mean, the only alternative is is a society that's dysfunctional, and we nobody wants that. Okay, a few people might, but you know. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So in order to bring the changes, you just talk about some examples, and it sounds like we need some make a really good storytelling. Narratives matter. Narratives matter, and fa and ma narratives can hurt you and help you, because if mm -hmm. you have a narrative that can't be changed, that you're bound by, and you don't regard, you don't look at the facts, you don't care about what's real. You just care about this idea that you have in your head. Then if your ideology drives you uh, against reality, then you're going to do stupid things. And that ha that's happened, uh, you know, that's the history of mankind is full of this kind of silliness. Mm -hmm. But at this point, you know, it, it kind of doesn't matter. Either we're going to fix this thing and we're going to have a future or the planet will do it for us. And maybe the insects will have a chance to take over where we, we failed. You know, we've only had our 15 seconds of fame. If you look at the history of uh, the pl on our history on the planet, it's been 15 seconds of fame. And maybe we can have another 15 seconds. Otherwise, the insects will come and take over and have their 15 seconds of fame. And, and pretty much, I think there is this dawning consciousness. I mean, when all of Australia is on fire, when Siberia is on fire, when you know you have mount uh, fires across all the way from Vancouver down to Taos, New Mexico, Chile, the forests are on fire. The whole world is Amazon. The Amazon is burning. This is not normal. It's not the and it's not a new normal that we can live in because you know it's just unsustainable. I mean, it doesn't sustain human life. And so, a philosophy is going to come, and is already here actually that says that's unacceptable. It's just that the traditional status quo sort of people who are not affected by this haven't gone the message yet but they're getting it and i think the kids are you know de definitely driving it uh, and I, I feel like the next five years will decide whether whether we you know perish or we you know continue so let's move to the extremism okay yeah, what do you mean by extremism? You're talking about fundamentalist or? Yes, all of the above. I'm talking about racism, sexism, uh, religious uh, bigotry, all forms of extremism where you basically are driven by an ideology, you're driven by some kind of hate, some kind of exclusionary thing where you exclude people. And again, this is also, you know, hate and exclusion usually is, is part of fear. It's driven by fear. And, and that's part of what, what uh, sort of uh, political messaging and stuff always buys into that and, and feeds that fear. And I think where we need to show that, you know, alternative facts are not facts, they're lies. And, uh, and, and that we've got to really examine what are these prejudices and how they, how they are formed. Because here's the thing, prejudice is not innate, it's learned. We teach that to our children. And so this is, if you have to learn to be prejudiced, to be an extremist, to be, then it's, it's possible that you can unlearn it or two, you can stop people from teaching it. And so that's what the problem is. Why does extremism happen? You know, and, and how does it happen? And I think that's part of the, the equation here is we need to examine what is it that creates extremism and and there are best practices for fighting extremism, for converting people back to sort of a rational world uh, using sort of, you know, good, good sense and common sense and decency. So that is possible. I have another question uh, about corruption, because we all know that corruption is a really big issue. And when you talk about why some countries are suffering, not necessarily because they don't have resources, it's not because they are not well educated, but it's more about the corruption, especially if the leadership is corrupt and if the institutions are corrupt and they cannot function well, then they cannot deliver the values to the, their people. So uh, when you choose this corruption, there must be some perspective from your side. Uh, can, could you share your insight on that? Yeah, sure. And, and I, think, I think you've hit the nail on the head. One of the problems that we see is that the fundamental underlying principle, why can't the government or why can't this institution or why can't that company do the job it's supposed to do properly is because 
corruption is defined as sort of taking something that's uh, for the public and diverting it into some other use. That's one definition of corruption. There are a bunch of them. And in fact, we go into this in quite detail in, in our brand activism book. And just recently, in fact, last week, actually, there was a book from Michael Porter and Catherine Gale, written by Catherine Gale as sort of the driver of this idea that our political system in the U.S. isn't messed up. It's actually working the way it was designed to work, which is for a few people. So that's a corrupt system, if you want to call it that. So we feel like if you look at the best practices of how to fight corruption, and again, the country that I would point to is New Zealand, which is the least corrupt country in the world. I'll give you a very nice quote from Plato. Okay, listen to this. Plato said something like this. When we're kids, we're afraid of the dark. But when we grow up, we're afraid of the light. And what I would say is that's what it is. Our leaders are afraid of the light. They don't want people to see how much money they're make, making. They don't want to see people. They don't want to know, uh, show their tax returns. They, and, and part of this is we need more transparency in our public officials. We need more transparency. We need, I'll give you another way of saying this. We need contact tracing for all the money flows that are happening around the world. The, the dark money and, and the, uh, you know, uh, the money flows. And if you can do that, you will find who's corrupt and what's going on. And part of this is, that's one reason why uh, you could say Bitcoin and si uh, the cryptocurrencies were invented because they have a ledger that uh, eliminates the corruption because you know where the money's been. And, and so there's a lot of, uh, I would say there's a lot of uh, movement uh, that we see towards uh, sort of anti-corruption practices. Another way to say this is, why doesn't anything happen regarding climate change? Because the politicians, perhaps, are not rewarded enough because they, they're rewarded by participants in the economy that don't want uh, change. So they're rewarded by the status quo. I understand that everybody understands that corruption is bad and we all understand that we have to get rid of it. Um, I mean, everybody knows that. So the question will be, so how we can make it happen? Right. As you just said, that it's just like a changing the culture, or maybe it's because maybe the stakeholders are not well rewarded, even if they change the, let's say, the bad practices or corruption, but still they don't get rewarded, they feel. Then maybe they are not motivated to stay away from corruption or they are not motivated to get rid of the corruption. Actually, they will be the ones who will support the corruption so that they can get profits. Yeah. So actually, greed is actually driver. Greed is people. the driver of all this stuff, of course. Yes. And greed and power are the two twins that go together. And yeah. so the point is, how do you manage that? The first problem mm -hmm. is power cannot be concentrated. This is Peter Drucker talking, by the way. It's the Austrian guy. Even Hayek was talking about this, which is you must uh, distribute power so that no one, there's no concentration of power in, in the hands of anybody because once that power gets concentrated, it doesn't matter who they are, they're going to get corrupt and get corrupted. So the first thing you could say, okay, we need to find a way so that we don't have these income inequalities that are happening. So that is actually an economic question. Do we allow a CEO in society to earn, you know, a thousand times more than what his uh, or her uh, worker does? Uh, so the question is, is it okay for a worker in your company to work a thousand years to earn what you earn in one year? Is that justice? Is that ethical? And part of this is we need more transparency. We can just embarrass these people. I mean, if everybody knew how much all these executives made and it was, it was like a running list and it was always saying, you know, we saw that all the time, people would go, you know, it would be embarrassing for them to, to even step out of their house. Part of the, That's one reason why all these things happen in darkness. We don't know what the compensation is. They don't want to tell us. Well, we create a new rule that says, guess what? I mean... Here's the other ultimate irony, especially in countries like in the West. What we have is we say we love democracy, but none of our companies run like democracies unless they're co-ops. But the traditional form of the corporation 
is not a democracy. In fact, it's a colonial monarchy, and it's modeled on the East India Company, which we know what it did in India. So that's the, the sort of structure and philosophy of the corporation is this thing that lands and loots and runs away and doesn't care about what happens to the people or the land or, or the environment. And, and I'm, of course, being, you know, exaggerating, but not really. If you look at the historical roots of what corporations are and how they came into being, you'll see that the corporation was not done. And here's the other thing that the corporations, they were given a license to function for a certain period of time, let's say two years. And if they did not serve society in those two years, you could take back their, their thing and they were no longer a corporation. Today, we just give them corporations and we can, we can never kill a corporation. We can't put it in jail. Even though they say we're human, they, they, you know, they, they say, well, we're not human when it comes to responsibility. So the structure of, and the, I've worked in corporations. It's not like I have anything against them, but we have to have justice as part of this wheel, as part of this economy. And I think to do that, we, you know, it cannot just be a bunch of people at the top who decide everything. It has to be more democratic. It cannot be just a few stakeholders who decide the future of the planet. It's got to be, you know, the citizens of the planet. And if you say, okay, uh, a company is, is a citizen, well, then a company needs to be a good citizen. And what is it that makes a good citizen? One way to be a good citizen is you can do it by yourself. But if you get all the other companies to do it with you, then you can all jointly say, you know, we agree that none of us are going to pollute the ocean or none of us are going to produce more uh, waste in, in this area at all, period. In fact, our whole industry is going to be based on the fact that we don't do that. That's a practice that's banned. But unfortunately, it's the other way around. Most companies are lobbying to make sure that they can get away with as much as they can get away with. And that, that's a recipe for you know, not having a future. Speaking of which, it reminds me that uh, public policies can be also manipulated because of the corruption. Because let's say the election is coming and you are the, let's say, ruling party and then you are the majority party. And then uh, you just want to make people happy and they rely on populism. And then they just start to, uh, doing, making all these public policies will just make people happy in the short term. I, even though those public policies can be damaging to the economy and then the country in the long term. And that, that's why, in a sense, an independent journalistic integrity is an important thing. One of the problems that we have in the world today is that there is no or very little journalistic integrity because all these news outlets are all owned by oligarchs. And they're all businesses that are making profit. And they're businesses that don't want to serve the people. I mean, the funny thing here is the government doesn't want to serve the people. If you read Michael Porter's latest book, he says... The government works very well for a handful and then not for anybody else. It doesn't care about anybody else. Is that really true? It seems to be in, in many cases. So I agree. I mean, we have a we have a real problem. And that's part of the, that's why corruption is sort of the number one thing here. Here's my paintbrush. You know, we're gonna paint a new world. But we need a world in which you know society must be redesigned to be responsible. And the politicians right now have no accountability. They're not accountable uh, accountable to the people. They're not accountable to anybody else. And again, they have so much power that they, they don't need to serve the people. They're just busy, you know, being corrupt, you know, making deals. And so the question then becomes, how do we create a society in which a politician cannot become corrupt even if they want to be? Mm. And so far, that problem has not been solved, ex except in a few countries. So what, we, what do we do? We go look at the countries that have the lowest corruption in the world. New Zealand, Finland, Norway. What is it that makes these countries less corrupt? What is it about their laws, about their policies, about their transparency, about running for office? Mm -hmm. Countries in which women are educated are the countries that are sort of the most advanced. And the more educated the woman the better the country does in terms of economics. And that's been shown by everybody to be a fact. So why aren't we educating women? Why aren't we making that like the priority? That's one priority. And I think it, it, it will affect all the other ones. It, it runs into education, runs into income inequality, runs into population, 
control uh, because what we've done is created an unjust world. And it's been, I mean, I don't know, the World Economic Forum had a thing that said at the current rate of equality between women and men, the rate at which it's, which it's going, it's going to take another 50 or 100 years for women to be equal to men in terms of pay. And this is in the advanced countries. So how are we going to get anything if we can't even do that? So part of this is to ask questions. You know, most people don't have the time. They're so busy running, doing their jobs, that they don't have time to think about this stuff. So in a sense, this project says, you know, we can't think about this all the time. But when we do think about it, you know, we look at what else has been done. We can, you know, add our little two cents to this model that's up there in the cloud that everybody can share. So that's, it's, it's sort of a problem solving uh, Wikipedia, Wikipedia, if you will, uh, to, mm -hmm. to help people under, and, you know, if you, if the problem isn't there or it hasn't been solved, well, put your solution and let other people add to it. So actually, in a way, what you're saying is, it's not necessarily about really the woman. It's more about if the woman is well educated, it's a reflection of the society. Absolutely. Being more open, right? Right. And then they, they might have a better system. Well, think about what makes a society more prog uh, progressive. What is it? What are the metrics that you can use to show that a, a society has its act together? Education, looking after its children, looking after its old people, looking after nature, looking after pets, looking after. Uh, so, so if you look at what is it that makes a country like New Zealand so progressive, so progressive that all the hedge fund managers who live in uh, who are in New York have all bought farms down in New Zealand to escape there when the world goes wrong. So what is it about New Zealand that drives them to create a better uh, future? Because their metrics are different. They're not measuring stuff by how well the economy is doing or the stock market. They're measuring stuff by how well their people are doing. That's a simple measurement. So if our governments would measure not the size of the economy, but the health and wealth of the individual people, we might have something to go by that would be different. Or the education attainment of, of its children. Or the job creation. And here's the thing. Job creation doesn't have to be this giant thing. You can create many tiny jobs that are fulfilling new new age jobs. They don't have to be... Uh, you know, flipping burgers at, at your local burger joint. That's not a job. That's that's a machine. You know, you're using person until the machine comes along. You're going to get rid of that person once the machine comes along. So here's the other thing. With the advent of robotics, we're going to have another 50% unemployment across the world. World. So what do you do with people then? Kill them? Get rid of them? Ha hope for a pandemic? That's not a solution. Although, you know, you could argue that the inaction of a cert of certain governments where they they are not doing anything to prevent a disease and the disease is actually killing uh you know indigenous populations or killing uh populations in that country that are uh, is like demographic genocide which you, you know you can't believe that that's possible but the outcome is that the outcome of in inaction yeah because those guys are the most vulnerable in the society it's not like the, uh, any organizations have the intention to do so, but what hap what's happening to those people most vulnerable in this society, actually, when it comes to the infection of COVID-19, it just shows that how vulnerable they have been. Yes. And that, that's what we should see now, right? The, the result. Right. When but wicked problems collide, like, like we see with COVID in the US, for example, it has unintended consequences with other wicked problems. So you have institutional racism, extremism, you know, so you have poor people are more affected because they're laid off at a higher rate. Uh, once the, So you have record unemployment, then you have low minimum wages. So you have people who have very low wages. So they're very poor. They have income inequality, not enough aid from the government. You end up with social unrest. Uh, you have a history of social injustice. That's what you see with the Black Lives Matter and the police uh, brutality happening. So all these problems, and then of course climate events, uh, you know, you could have uh, flooding or you could have tornadoes and hurricanes or you could have uh, any kind of fires, forest fires, all those sort of climate events 
also have a greater impact on the poor because once they get knocked off, they can't recover uh, as quickly as anybody else, uh, as, as, as quickly as wealthy people. And so they're stuck in poverty and in many cases fall even further in debt, fall further into uh, problems. And really there's no escaping uh, this uh, vicious circle of poverty. Actually, that's what we are looking at now. So um, when it comes to the get, getting rid of the corruption, uh, we really have to change the system. And we already talked about the education. It's we very easy. Talked. You know what you do? You yeah. have to go back to read what is it that, how do you create a civil a society of administrators that is not corrupt? What are the best practices mm -hmm. for that? Unfortunately, the UN has some best practices, but they don't follow them. So how we can change the system? Because the, because of the system, uh, we talked about education is one key element to bring up the changing. And then it's accountability. Mm. It's accountability. How do you hold uh, your leaders accountable? Mm -hmm. And here's the thing: I don't have the answers. I've read a bunch of stuff, and we've all. But here's what we're going to do: we're going to find what the best practices are in that field of corruption and preventing corruption. What is it that creates transparency? What kind of laws must be passed to be to become more like New Zealand, the least corrupt country in the world, or like uh, Finland, or like some of those Scandinavian countries? Maybe it has to do with the fact that nobody needs to be corrupt if you earn enough money for a living. You know, maybe that's part of it. Another part of it is the laws and how they're written, uh, and that if somebody does break the law, guess what? They go to jail. They don't just get away scot-free. That's part of it. How do you hold? So it comes about down to all these points. And what I'm thinking is, as part of this project, we're going to find the answer. See, I don't have the answer. I have some idea where to look. I've read some of these, you know, anti-corruption things, best practices in fighting corruption. The UN has some manual and standards. But obviously, we haven't solved this problem. And mm -hmm. like I said, you know, what if we could do contact tracing for your money? So... Every piece of money that comes into my bank account that touches me, I know where it's been, and everybody knows where it's been. So I can't just suddenly in pull money out of the sky or from under the table. Now that's kind of a draconian system, you know. So maybe, may, you know, I'm not sure I want people to know how much money I don't make or make, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the question then becomes: How do you create a, a society where you don't even need these things? Because, you know, because just because few people are crooks doesn't mean 80% of the people are honest. There's, an, there's actually a great story of a corrupt company. When the CEO took over, this was a company in Scandinavia. It was a waste management company. The CEO took over and they he found all kinds of waste practices that were happening. So one example of what they were doing that was corrupt instead of recycling their, uh, uh, recycling and, uh, putting their, uh, electronic uh, goods through the process of separation and, and putting away the different pieces. They just buried it in the trash and shipped it to the Far East because it's a lot mm. cheaper for that trash company to get rid of the trash that way than to actually do what is actually required. So you know what this guy did? He said, we are not going to tolerate any of that junk. Anybody who does this is going to have to leave. Guess what happened? 30% of the senior management and 40 or 50% of the employees left. The company started from scratch. But then something happened. It became a virtuous company. Everybody started hiring it. And it changed the entire culture of its industry. So it can be done, but you need exceptional people. Here's the problem. There are only a few handful of exceptional people. So how do you design a system that makes sure that exceptional or not, you're going to do the right thing. And I think that's the challenge. And that's what we're going to do. This is, this is what the discovery process is going to be. We want to, you're part of this thing. We want you discovering that with us. Because mm -hmm. here's the thing. Corruption is the thing that destroys your, your future. It destroys my future. It destroys our children's future. You know, mm -hmm. why is the government doing nothing for us? Why is the company doing nothing for its customers? Why is, uh, you know, the CEO making uh, a thousand times what its employee is making and its employee can barely eat and the CEO is buying his fifth yacht and, you know, buying his 40th mansion. Is that how we want to live? 
I mean, that's why, in a sense, you could say that's why we had the French Revolution. And, and look, we're going to have a French Revolution 2.0 because they never learned their lesson the first time. These, these guys were the oligarchs and the, the aristocrats. You could say the new aristocracy of the world is sort of these CEOs of, instead of the Duke of Burgundy, you have the Duke of Exxon. Or the Duke of whatever company you put uh, company name here. I'm only half kidding, but I'm really not because the inco income inequality is sort of the driving income inequality and corruption kind of feed each other. Who has the funds? These rich guys who didn't pay their taxes. So a funny thing to say is just pay your taxes, guys. And this was something that was actually said by an economist at the World Economic Forum a few years ago. His name was Bregman. I forget his first name. But he's, he's just written a new book, by the way. The idea is, you know, you have to design society in a way that, that doesn't allow corruption to become the dominant uh, power structure of things. And, of course, in Asia, we have, a, we have a historical problem with corruption because it goes back to how people are promoted, how people are rewarded, how, what is the status-seeking kind of thing that happens, what are the rents that are collected every step of the way. Nobody wants to give that up, especially if it's generational corruption or intergenerational corruption. It's not going to go away. So another mm -hmm. way to do it is to break away from that economy and build a new economy that doesn't depend on the old one. And there are people doing that. That's very small, but there are all kinds of regenerative sort of economy, economic structures that are being built, uh, co-ops, Mondragon in Spain, uh, there's even a small company that I, I've been looking at in New Zealand called Enspiral that is sort of a new kind of capitalism where all these small businesses, they share a bunch of services so they don't have to pay for it uh, in, in, you know, by themselves. So they share an infrastructure, almost like a platform, and then they contribute what they can to make part uh, you know, to, for the value that they get. Are they trying to grow? No, they're just trying to support their founders. So it's a different model that goes beyond growth into just sustainable businesses. You can be sustainable if you're growing like a cancer. And growth, if you look at these giant companies, is metastatic. These guys want to be like cancers. They just, 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 just grow and, and uh, take over everything. That's not healthy. In fact, you can define the way that people want you know, 20, 30, 40% growth a year. That's not healthy. That's, that's actually a, def a definition of a cancer. So we have an economic system that encourages cancer. Based on what you're saying, actually, it's also connected to health and livelihood. I think uh, I can think about one case that husband in the working in the company really wants to take the paternity leave, but he cannot. Uh, regulation is there. And then uh, the company also says that you can take the paternity leave. But no one, no man in the company has taken until leave. System is there, public policy is there, regulation is there, the co company regulation is also there, but nobody can use it because they understand that if they take a paternity leave, they might have to leave forever. Yeah. Because they, they might be misunderstood because if anything goes wrong, they will say that, ah, you see, this is because he doesn't pay attention to his own work. He pay attention to his family more. So, so that's, even a, that's a dysfunctional to... company. You're right. Yeah, yeah. And this mm -hmm. is a problem that's always been the case. For example, in the in, back in the good old days when companies could hire five-year-old and ten-year-old children to sit, sit there and work for ten hours, twelve hours a day, right? Those children mm -hmm. did not do anything except worked in the thing, and if they protested, they were kicked out, and the next kid was brought in, right? So what changed? Mm -hmm. Laws were passed. Now mm -hmm. a law could be passed that said that when you have a kid, you automatically have to take off. Mm. You can't, you, in fact, it's illegal for you to come to work for six months or mm. whatever it is. Mm. What if we did that? The other thing that happens is employees don't have any power. And so they feel like they're left out. There is no representation. You know, like I said, uh, companies claim they like democracy, but none of them are run like democracies. So the question then becomes, how can you build a democratic structure into a company that is still efficient and effective? And I'll give you an example from the world of sports. So 
think of the two biggest soccer teams in the world. And I'm sure all your viewers know who these are. So one example, Manchester United, you know, big history. Another example, let's say Barcelona, you know, and you compare those two teams. One team is owned in the traditional model of a corporation, which is there's a guy at the top who has all the money. And he basically call, you know, he basically hires everybody else and he's the boss and he takes a bunch of the profits. The other version is the team is owned by a bunch of members and it's not owned by one guy. And they elect who the leader of that team is and who the president of the organization is. It's elected by all the members. Which team do you think has done a better job on the field over time in terms of performance? So it is possible in a very competitive space to use this worker driven sort of capitalism to get success and not only get success, but be even better than the other model, which is sort of the Attila the Hun model where you have some guy at the top who's beating up everybody else uh, as, as the head gorilla. So it is possible to create organizations that are perfectly functional, very high performance organizations, but are yet democratic. And I think that's the direction we have to head in. Actually, I gave you the example of the companies, not only about companies, you know, it's also a whole society yeah. because the whole society actually doesn't accept it. And then uh, that's why it happens over and over again in many countries. So I used to work for a very uh, engineering company where the culture of the company said that you had to mm -hmm. be there. Even if you did no work, you had to be there till eight o'clock at night. Right. And mm -hmm. if you left before that, then you weren't a hardworking employee. Mm -hmm. Now I had a I had this idea that you know maybe I should spend time with my family, and if the time to leave because I would get there at seven in the morning. This is of course uh, American company, so the the work hours are much less than Asian. But here's the thing: I if I if I had to work for an Asian company which said, "Hey, you have to be here eighteen hours a day," and I had a choice then I wouldn't be there. The problem is we feel like we have no choice because we are we grow up in a with the narrative that you're stuck with this company, you have to you know be loyal to this company for the rest of your life. The question is, is, is the company equally loyal to you? And what does that loyalty mean? Does it allow you to have a life or does it just put you on the on the thing and just turn the handle and turn you into you know sausage? So Guess what I did? I left at 3.15. Maybe I worked 15 extra minutes and then I left. And people would look at me like, what you, where is he going? And I talked to the manager of the engineering would walk by and say, hey, where are you leaving? Well, how come you're leaving so early? And I had this smart aleck Deming answer from Deming, which is, I did my job right the first time. That was my funny answer to these guys. Mm. But what they did was I was lucky enough to be good enough at my job that they didn't want to fire me. Mm -hmm. And so I let, when I did leave, I left on my own accord. You know, I, I left because I wanted to leave, not because they kicked me out. And not everybody has that luxury, of course, you know? So the question then becomes, how do you create a workplace that's safe and, and, and really looks after its employees and the future? You have unions, that's how you do it. In fact, there's a very good story. Of, in fact, there's a book called Viking Economics, which talks about how is it that the workers in those Scandinavian countries are paid so well and uh, are able to function in a very capitalistic and business-friendly environment, yet the workers are paid so well and the CEOs don't get paid as high as these other guys. They get paid well. They're just not getting paid a 1,000 times the worker's salary. And the answer is, is to be found in history. When Rockefeller left the U.S. on his world tour, he gave instructions to his uh, bosses to break all the unions in the U.S. And when he came back, he became this big philanthropist after he had destroyed all the unions. In Scandinavia, the, they tried to intimidate the unions. The unions fought back with weapons against it and kept their rights as workers and never looked back. 
So in a sense, it's it's a, it's a it's a it's a worker revolution, but it's not revolution as in communism or socialism or anything. It's it's really workers' rights. You don't want to work eight days a week, you know. You don't want to work till you know till the stars are out at night. You want to have a family. You want to spend some time. You want to have a weekends off. And the smarter here's the other thing: what smart company, what smart employee, who has a choice of leaving? Is going to work for a company that works like that? Nobody. Why do you think there's this competition to be the best company that you can work for? Because companies want to attract the best talent. If your company needs to compete in the future, it cannot keep smart people tied to their desks like slaves. It's not going to happen. These smart guys are going to go to the company that gives them something better. That's a horrible way to think of the future. You know, I much prefer it the where companies say, uh, in fact, I just took a class recently with Scott Galloway where he was talking about the accelerants. Uh, and one of the accelerants, one, uh, the, one of the, he called it the T algorithm. The T algorithm says that one of the uh, key things for these big four companies that have grown trillion dollar companies is that everybody wants to work for them. How do they do that? They pay them well. They look after them. They pamper them. Yes, they're high standards for performance, but they give you everything. So everybody wants to, the smartest guy in the world, where does he work? He goes, what's he working on? Some ads, you know, how to optimize a click. How sad. You know, this guy should be working on solving me on my wicked problems. Not, you know, fixing, you know, which click gets the best hits or which algorithm makes them the most money in terms of, you know, distributed ad, uh, ad serving or whatever that's depressing you know that guy should be solving the world's problems and that's the other problem we have is that we don't have our best minds working on these wicked problems the next question will be uh, about the population migration so you're, you're trying to say that we have to reduce the population or we have to increase population or because japan and south korea for instance that we are the lowest uh, birth rate countries in amongst the OECD. And then uh, some countries is actually have more population. So, and then they want to work and make more money in, in advanced countries. So they also migrate. So uh, what is the issue with the uh, migration and then population when you talk about it? All right, there's several pieces of this. So one, let's start with the Japan and Korea having such dismal population growth rates, negative growth rates, basically. Germany, Eastern Europe, all those guys had the same problem going on. The one country that was a anomaly in, was France. And France did this by creating certain policies that were family friendly, gave people more time off, gave people more time to sort of interact, uh, look after their kids. They created a kinder and gentler sort of a national approach to having children and and creating an environment for that. If you have an environment that says you have to kill yourself to work, who wants to have children when you're so busy working? Nobody has time for kids. So perhaps this is sort of the short-sightedness of, of a culture that says work is more important than family because you know we're competing against the world, so we've got to work 18 hours a day. Who, nobody's going to have kids. It's, it's it's Even wild animals, if you put them in a zoo, all of a sudden they have no kids. They don't have children. They don't mate. Why? Because they, they're not in an environment that makes them want to have kids. So what will it take to create a culture and an environment in Japan and Korea for people to have children? That's a good question. You know, That's a wicked problem right there. <laughs> but so, I, mean, I, I know so it has been done. It's been done in France. I need to go back and read about it and look into it. But I remember for mm. a fact that France improved its growth rate. of It was like this booming uh, baby boom thing happened when they changed mm. their governmental policies to encourage, you know, time off from work, more benefits for people, a bunch of different things. But most mm. of all, what is it that people want if they, they want fun? They want to be able to hang out with their friends. They want to have a culture that you can look forward to a future. But if you have to look forward to being a zombie in a, at a workstation or, you know, work killing yourself at work, what, who wants that? Nobody. 
Also, it, climate doesn't hurt. So if you move Japan another, let's say, you know, 20 degrees south, it might help with the population growth, you know, because you have nice weather. Makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. and, and that's even culturally, if you look at what cultures have sort of the, the most uh, joie de vivre, you know, I don't know if you read Zorba the Greek, you know, it's a very famous book about living and living life to the fullest. It has to do with the sun and and fruits and the, the sensual things in life, you know, and, and, you know, Camus wrote all kinds of books about the Mediterranean man and all this, you know, but I think government policies can be a lot more friendly to encourage the short, that's the shortcuts answer <laughs> that, that I think the government needs to think about it. Part of the problem is in any company, if the successful person doesn't have a family and never spent any time with the family, then you have an entire corporate culture that's dysfunctional. Hmm. However, if you have a mom and all her managers are women, what happens? Overnight, your culture is different. People will go home and, and take their uh, vacations, paternity vacations. So that's another way you can say, hey, in upper management, 50% of the people have to be women because the future hmm. belongs to women. And hmm. I'm not just saying that because, you know, I'm some feminist or something. I'm saying that because I think that actually makes sense mm -hmm. because they're actually better ecosystem thinkers than men who, and you know, there's all kinds of cheesy theories. You know, men are very good at hunting and gather and the women are good at gathering. They're good at community things. We're good at like going and beating somebody up. We're good at war. They're good at peace. Okay. Let's talk about population migration now. So mm -hmm. the example what I'm talking about is as, as these Middle Eastern countries have more war, and they get hotter and hotter in the summer because of global warming. These people are suffering. They're just going to go to the places that they can, where they can exist, where they can live, where they can find a job, maybe where they can, the rich countries basically that can afford to give them some crumbs off the table. This migration problem isn't going to get better. It's going to get worse from Africa, from the Middle East into Europe, for example. And one way to stop that is to basically fight global warming, to create jobs in those countries, and to create peace. How do you market peace? This is what something that Phil and I have been talking about for a long time, and he's sort of a guru on that because he actually works with the, I think it's the Hiroshima Foundation, to market peace. But the way to market peace is take, to take the profit out of war. That's really what we need to do. And I think that's part of why war is part of our Wicked Seven, because we want to look at what are the things that are driving war that we can take away that will reduce the incentive to go to war. And one of it is the profits the companies make when they sell guns and ammunition and all kinds of new tech. One of the Wicked Seven issues is that inequality. Yes. So when we talk about inequality, um, what do you have in mind in specific? Oh, a few years ago, there was a book written by Thomas Piketty where he talked about capitalism, you know, and, and the growing income inequality between the rich and the poor and the gap between this, like the lack of a middle class. The problem, whenever we have inequality above a certain uh, coefficient, ab above a certain Gini coefficient, you end up with conflict. Uh, last time we saw this kind of inequality, we had trade wars, we had world wars, we had economic collapse. And that was, of course, the Great Recession back in the Depression that I'm talking about back in the 30s, 29, 30. Uh, the same things happen now. We have actually higher in income inequality in the U.S. than we've ever had before, uh, even bigger than the Great Depression. And when that happens... You have a, a small segment of society that has all the good things and everybody else is just wandering around like a surf on, on the land. So you could even say, you know, there's a very famous book called The Road to Serfdom by one of those Austrian, uh, by Hayek. He's an Austrian econ economist. And of course, his point was the road to sur serfdom is communism and, ca and socialism and capitalism will save the world. Well, it turns out, that capitalism also was a road to serfdom. And you could argue that it doesn't matter what economic or political system you have, 
if it's corrupt, you're going to end up in serfdom. The people will suffer. And when that happens, when you have too many poor people, what happens? People get, I mean, it's a social unrest, uh, disease. And, and so this is one reason why America has lost its way is because it doesn't have uh, a middle class that's strong or prosperous anymore. So for the first time, you know, uh, our children in the U.S. are looking at a future that's worse than their parents. And that used to be part of the American dream is that if I work hard, I can do better than my parents. And that that's gone. It all sounds familiar and we are already kind of familiar with all those actually problems, issues you just mentioned. So how are we going to make it happen at the end of the day? And maybe that's why you talk about the brand activism and also you work with Philip Kotler and marketing group. So we have to market kind of or brand this, all these activities because it's all relevant to our future and our life. No, that's a, that's a very good question. How is this going to happen? Especially if you have zero resources and you're not a company and this is just done kind of for fun. And by fun, I mean, you know, the next 20 years, I'm going to work on this because, you know, this is not something that's going to get solved uh, overnight. So the way I look at this is we're not really solving the problems. We're not going to. What we're going to do is get people to think about these problems, start discovering new ways to model these problems and communicate these problems so more and more people will start using these kinds, this kind of thinking that connects everything to everything else. So the, the if this project can, let's say, get people to start thinking this way in, in terms of systems and, and impact unintended consequences on, the, on things. And in the past, this was sort of the province of just academic people. So academic people would be all into the systems diagrams and stuff, but very few lay people, normal human beings or just you know, citizens would get into this kind of thing. I'm not thinking normal people are going to get into this, but I feel like we have a chance if we do this right to at least get a number of people into this, um, I'd say a couple of thousand people involved in this kind of thing. And that is the seeds of the future in terms of thinking this way. Now, we may also actually come up with some diagrams and solutions that are actually very interesting and and informative and actually help people learn how to solve and examine these problems. So I feel like that's part of it as well. We want people to look at how do you create public value instead of just private value? How do you create value for the commons, for things that we have in common? What kind of policies should we think about or you know discover from, let's say, finding best practices in one country and bring them, bringing them over sort of to a universal kind of model? that we can all learn from. Uh, and that's really what the goal of this project is, uh, is to really try to break the boundaries between these problems because they can't be solved one at a time. They can't be solved in compartments. They've actually got to be integrated. This is why companies can't solve problems by themselves. Governments can't solve problems by themselves because these problems aren't in boundaries. They're boundaryless. They're world worldwide, global. That's why they're wicked problems. And the first thing we can do is just try to understand them. And the, how do you understand anything? You draw a picture. If you can draw a picture and show how what things interact, then you've got some a start on how to understand stuff. So that's what we're trying to do is figure out a way to understand what these problems are, learn from each other, learn from the experts, and put it all in one place so that this learning isn't sitting in some book somewhere that or some... An article in some academic journal that nobody reads. And do you have any closing remark that you want to emphasize to the viewers? Sure. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for the, your insightful questions too. You know, COVID-19 is really a wake-up call for all of us. What it says is the current infrastructure that we have in place, the economic system, the business systems, the supply chains are not geared for a, a world that's unstable at all. In fact, we've optimized stuff. We've made everything very efficient and effective, but it breaks easily. So we're going to have to work on two things. One is 
business resiliency. How do we actually work on businesses that work together and are much more resilient when shocks happen? Because they're going to be a lot more shocks. And, and, and then the second thing is societal resiliency. How do we create a society across the world that doesn't just fall off at the first uh, sign or the first problem that it faces? Because COVID-19, I can guarantee you, is just the tip of the iceberg. We're, we're going to face a whole bunch more issues. And if we don't think about them and, and think uh, right, uh, before they happen, then we will not be as prepared as we might be if we actually understand that this could happen and here's how we might be able to solve some of these things because they're coming. Climate change is here. If, if we don't do anything about it, COVID will be nothing compared to climate change. So viewers, uh, you know that if you don't subscribe to our channel, you know that you are missing out a lot. So please subscribe to our channel and I'm going to invite more experts and thought leaders so that we can broaden our horizon. Thank you for watching today's session. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good night. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, David. Thanks so much. Take care. Yeah.